Mute your mic, John. 10 4. All right, we're live. Good evening, everybody. It's Thursday. It's April Fools. As you can hear, my voice is a little bit under the weather. So I'm happy to be joined with uh, John and Carrie and a special guest tonight, Alicia Scott of the Alicia Scott, the Air Scott Hour on All Things Relevant Media, Fridays at 9 p.m. Also a co-host of The Rabble on Wednesdays with uh, Julius and a whole slew of other people that are a good, good gang of voices on that show. Uh, I've known Alicia for about five years, basically since you got here. Uh, the Bernie Sanders, the original 2016 campaign, I think is when we first started uh, working together on various political issues. So I'm really happy uh, to be joined uh, by you this evening. Thanks for joining. How are you doing tonight, Alicia? I'm good, Chuck. Thank you for having me. Thanks. Yeah, it's been about, yeah, I guess about five, five or six years now. I think I met you before the Bernie Sanders campaign and I, I, I was, uh, got the Bernie Sanders job in 2016. So, um, yeah, I've been in Georgia now. I've been here 10 years. I'll make 10 years in May. So it's been a while. So thanks for having me. Awesome. Well, just a quick update to our viewers before we jump into this, uh, hopefully really exciting interview. Uh, yesterday was the last day of the Georgia legislative session. It's known as sine die for those familiar with the Latin phrase, uh, but it was the last day of the session. Happy to report that the hotel motel tax did not get passed uh, as we had advocated against in the prior two weeks. Uh, I hope that it sends a message to the city, its leaders and its partners that, you know, they need to come back to the table for, a plan with more diversity, more equity, and more inclusion, and not just talking points to that effect. Uh, we'll have more on that issue, you know, maybe later on this summer, uh, now that the legislative session is over, uh, we will be, you know, maybe, maybe we'll do another show uh, back on that issue. Uh, but, uh, you know, real quick, Alicia, you know, any thoughts on, on that whole saga as it played out over the last two weeks? This, this kind of dominated parts of our last few shows. Um, yeah, so uh, thoughts on the hotel motel tax defeat or the voter suppression bill? I mean, we, we can go right into that one or, uh, right after that, but I want to just lead off because that was something that had dominated our, our last few show topics and yeah. I wanted to get your take on. Yeah, I, I mean, if you go back to our show last week, you know, I mean, we have a, a segment that's been highly viewed, uh, you know, responding kind of to uh, one of the people at the paper 
uh, their take on, on a lot of this stuff. And, and there was another op-ed that came out after John, you know, that, that uh, we talked about privately uh, that <laughs> is predicting such wild political speculation. Uh, I didn't know that the Savannah Morning News was uh, was Politico playbook now. Um, so I just want to get your take on that saga, you know, it, whether about the defeat or not, or, or just how it played out. Um, I think that I, I think that the opposition to it was was spot on. Um, so Savannians are tired of being cannibalized by the tourism industry. Um, it benefits only the hoteliers and it, it just cannibalizes the citizenry. It cannibalizes, it cannibalizes residents, homeowners, um, and, and just the workforce in general. There is absolutely um, very little benefit to the actual community of Savannah. And one of the questions I heard asked mostly in the community was, if they're going to raise, you know, the hotel motel tax by these couple points, and then they're going to restructure the allocation that the city gets and, and how it goes back into, you know, visit Savannah, the chamber and all these quasi pseudo public entities, which are not really public entities because the city doesn't have any, you know, any purview over them. Why isn't it going to raise wages? If we're charging people more to come and visit Savannah, why aren't we paying these hotel workers, the hospitality industry workers, uh, more money? Because it just doesn't make sense. And so I think that Savannah and this attempt to, to increase the hotel motel tax and then restructure these allocations um, is, is another micro sign of us being in a late stage democracy. Um, we, we're, we're just in a late stage democracy. The, the, the business investments are public, you know, they're socialized while the profits are privatized. So we're in something else other than a democracy when that happens, you know, we're taking these public monies, these public pools of money and we're privatizing the profits made after them. So I think that that whole saga, I think it was well played by all the local advocates here um, I think it was a win for the people of Savannah because it's time for private industry to, to start pitching in their fair share of the pot. This is corporate welfare on steroids. I mean, it is, it is corporate welfare on steroids and Savannah is a corporate welfare queen. She's the queen of the corporate welfare South. And she's using this hospitality industry to, to pad the pockets of, quite frankly, a bunch of companies who don't have enough innovative intellect to create money from other places other than to cannibalize it from pub public coffers. They use the government as an organ to create sustainable generational wealth because none of them are smart enough to actually innovate and create something new and create in this economies of scale with new um, economic development ideas. Let's, let's just be honest there. They don't have the gumption to create a product or any type of new service. They're not bright enough to, to innovate in technology um, or any other place. All they know how to do is how do we get local government to give us another check? and they live and subsist off of public money in its entirety. They're the textbook definition of corporate welfare queens. And I think that the defeat of that bill was a big win for the people of Savannah. Well, I appreciate the answer. You know, Alicia, in the last election in 2019, tourism management was probably the number one issue amongst voters. And as we know, you know, seven incumbents got sent home, uh, you know, or seven people lost in that election that were kind of running a status quo on that issue. Uh, and, and Eddie's council, you know, spent a quarter billion in bond money uh, on this industry, and it, and it really ended up costing them. Do you think that this council, this new council uh, with a slim majority is heading down that same path? Wow, this new council is 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 an interesting motley crew. Um, I, I would, I don't, I think that we're all of the talent, we're all of the innovative policy people are. 
um, where all of the genuine public servants are, um, they're in the, the minority. And I don't think that the, the, the five votes, you know, the gaggle of five, I don't know that they have the, let me, let me find a nice word for it. I don't know that they have the political will to, to, to do what's right and to not make the same mistakes. I do think that this will be another um, a set of one-termers. I think that they'll be cleaned out um, just like the last, just like Edna's regime, just like Eddie's regime. We're gonna, we, we got one more cycle uh, to get the bad seeds out. I'm, I'm really disappointed to see that, um, you know, Linda Wilder Bryan and Dietrich Leggett, they ran on this very progressive for the people campaign and they've gotten into office and their lick spittles. And it's really sad, you know, the fire in Linda Wilder Bryant, Councilwoman Bryan's uh, belly that she had for four years from her after her first run has just fizzled out. Um, and, and the same goes for Dietrich Leggett, you know, but I, I think that, I think that, you know, I, I don't know what I think. I don't know what has happened other than, you know, the same old, same old money, you know, steak dinners. They probably took him out there on, on that jet. We, I won't say his name, but we, we all know you're on a private jet and you take all the black elected leaders on your private jet. And they've never been on a private jet and it's fancy to them. And you know you've won them over. Once they take a ride on the jet, you know they lay down. Um, so <laughs> you know, so that that's the key. You know, he pulls up his private jet and he flies them around, and he takes them uh, to a hundred and fifty dollar dinner. He takes them hundred and fifty miles outside of Savannah, and they become um, um, lick spittles, and their political will is completely drained. It's almost like a, a, a an, it's almost like a vampiric move because it just it just dims the light of what would have and could have been really great elected officials who could have made a who can still but who could have made a really wonderful and lasting legacy getting things done in the city of Savannah but again they will go down likely as another um, motley crew of, of disappointment uh, it, for the people of Savannah so do I think that they um, will not make the same mistakes as Deloach's regime? Absolutely not. I actually don't think that they pay close enough attention to anything going in council and they just check the box. They check the box that the mayor says check. They don't read um, and they're not interested in even understanding. They're just there to collect their little paycheck, to ride on that jet whenever they're offered, to get freebies at all the hotels around town and to take pictures for Facebook uh, for photo ops. So I, I have no faith that this regime won't, and, and, and I won't blame it on the entire council. We, we know who the five are. I have no faith that they're not going to run Savannah even further into the ground, just on sheer lack of political will and the gumption to actually care. Did John, I lose go you? ahead. John, go ahead. No, I'm I'm here. Uh, thank you. I, I want to remind everybody. Uh, interestingly, the title for this episode of Better Savannah Discussions was uh, titled uh, "Business as Usual," and what you just described, Alicia, regrettably, uh, while while we had this historic election uh, just 15 months ago that promised change and innovation and, and change. Uh, yeah, it's been a huge disappointment. Um, I'd like to walk back for just a second to uh, the hotel motel sales tax. And one of the uh, standout ironies for me is that in the memoram memorandum of understanding between Visit Savannah and, and, and the city, uh, as well as the city council's resolution to the delegation requesting uh, this bill. Nowhere what, was there any mention or requirement for uh, community benefits agreements or um, women and minority business participation. And how soon do we forget that our biggest number one overarching 
you know, multi-decade problem is poverty. So here you have a bill uh, that, you know, on, on the surface, uh, somebody else is paying that two cents, that 2% for the most part, they're, they're, they're visitors, tourists. And, you know, that's certainly attractive and why SPLOS continues to get renewed. But how quickly do we forget that the city struggles with so many decades of, uh, you know, double digit poverty, twice the national average. And here's an opportunity of $7 million of recurring revenue every year. And we didn't even have the uh, wherewithal to tie the two together. Well, one of the reasons why I think it was a good thing it, it went down and can get, you know, fine tuned and uh, brought, brought back because you know they're bringing it back. So the other thing I want to point out that, that I personally find interesting is Michael Brown. Um, uh, you know, his, his legacy and his reputation uh, was impeccable, but the guy left almost 11 years ago and he's come back. And I think Michael Brown thinks it's uh, 2010. And the way council walked, talked and performed uh, during his 15 year tour, which ended in 2010, it's not the same. There is a, con uh, a, a group on council that is just not gonna accept business as usual and, and they're gonna question it. And I, I, I see him melting down with this uh, irritation and frustration, but I just wanna say, Michael Brown, it's not 2010. You need to adapt to this emergence on council of uh, trying to change business as usual. So anyway, I, I think the sooner we get uh, a new city manager, uh, the better off we're, we're gonna be. Do you really think that we're going to get a new city manager? This, this feels like, you know, it feels like a cutter playbook. Um, you know, I, I think that here's my theory and I don't have any proof that this is really what's going on. So my disclaimer is, this is my opinion, my theory. It could be way out and outlandish. I put that out there before I say it. My theory is that that um, whatever it was uh, Edna's regime was supposed to get done, that didn't get done because she lost her election and that Eddie couldn't get done or wouldn't do, Michael Brown has just been brought back in to do that. There's some deals I'm sure, I, I know that this fairgrounds deal was something left on the table. Somebody had their eyes on that. Michael Brown has been brought in to do exactly like you said, push those backdoor deals from, from you know, that started, you know, 11 years ago all, all the way through. Um, Michael Brown is probably irritated because he's used to, and, and, and forgive me, I'm going to get just a little bit racial, but I think you know that that doesn't apply to, to everyone. I'm speaking specifically. Um, Michael Brown is not used to outspoken black women. Mm. He's used to, he's, and that bothers some old white men. And it bothers old white men from the South specifically. You and I get along great. We're Los Angelinos, you know, we're, we don't, we, we, we didn't grow up with seeing things through the lens of color. We just, you know, we've got a diverse group of friends, family, relatives. Um, here in the South, it's very polarized. And, you know, these are, these, are, these are mouthy Black women to an old Southern white man. And if he's looking irritated, you know, that's normal, that he's not used to women who actually read their council books, question what's going on. So he, one of two things is going to happen. He's going to give up because those women will uh he'll get tired before they do <laughs> yeah I, I i think he's he's tiring and it shows and that tells me uh we're, we're we're coming to a major eruption here and so the sooner they can get back uh to the search deal the better and on that next search i you know the mayor cannot just expect a unanimous vote on everything that's 2010 that that's 2005 that those days are over. 
you know, the, the average life expectancy of a, of a city manager these days is probably less than five years. And we, yeah. keep, we, we keep saying, well, uh, you know, we should get another Michael Brown who will stay for, you know, 15, 15 years. You're living in the past. Think, things are moving too quickly and there's too much angst in this community, which I welcome because it's, it's deserved. It really is. So, and, 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 I, and I, yeah, and I think it's a part of change. I think we all, ex Savannah is not going to change in, in just one cycle of council. You know, we wanted to see radical change with Eddie. There was some change, but change happens in incremental movements. Um, and so it's going to take two or three cycles of council. One, we still have the same vestiges of the status quo with Van Johnson. You know, he's going on 20 years there. So, you know, he's the, he's the last one that needs to go because his mindset is also stuck there. So when you have a mayor who's stuck to 10 and 15 years ago, who brings in the city manager, you know, who's stuck in 10 years ago, we got to undo. That's like, consider that the last knot in, the, in, in Savannah's achy back. Boy, I... I... I, I sure hope you're right and, and that incrementalism is uh, at work and that the next election will liberate this place uh, away from business as usual. Um, you know, where, where winners take all. Uh, the whole, yeah, I, 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 I've said it so many times, the constant business development and growth here in the almost 30 years that I've been here is phenomenal. Uh, I, you can't open up the daily paper and not see some uh, celebratory uh, news that the port is doubling or new airlines are coming in or uh, seed has got a new deal. Um, but if that's business as usual, they have to own the double digit 28% poverty that's never changed. You can't have it both ways. So, you know, I, I don't think I'm being unreasonable. Uh, we get called unreasonable in a lot of other stuff, but <laughs> if you step back and objectively look at, you know, 20, 20 30 years of tourism development, uh, port development, uh, SCAD development, um, and, and yet we're stuck on 28% on poverty, you got to accept that if you're gonna take credit for all the other stuff. That, that's my contention. Well, I think that they accept it, John. And I also think it's by design. Um, it is by design. Listen, I, I've got some great history books that talk about, you know, and I hate to go back to this. Um, when I look, if you look at Savannah over a continuum of her, since her inception. I know where you're going Savannah. With. Yeah, you know where I'm going. Savannah has always been the hospitality, come and party, summer soiree city. But, you know, in the 1800s, slaves worked in all the hotels. Slaves ran the railroad. They ran the restaurants. There were no common people jobs in the city of Savannah. You had the urban slaves and you had the rural slaves. That's why all the little carriage houses exist in all those houses downtown. The slaves lived in the carriage house or in the underground houses and all these beautiful houses on the square. They gave them two, they gave them two black churches so they could feel like they had a little reprieve. People don't want to, people don't want to hear that first African Baptist church was designed for slave management, urban slave management in the city of Savannah. There, people travel from all over the country to come down to Savannah to stay at her hotels and eat her eat at her fine restaurants. It's always been a hospitality. Uh, it's called the hospitality city, and it always has been. This is old money, and they want to keep this industry alive. Savannah, the the, the previous city manager, um, Rob Hernandez, told me Savannah is beautiful, but she lives in her history. She literally lives in her history where other cities have turned their tourism and their history into a very rich quality 
historical experience. You go to Charleston, they celebrate African-American history over there. They're building a beautiful Af you know, African-American museum over there, not a slavery museum, but an African-American cultural museum. They celebrate the Gullah Geechee over there. And it's a, it's a beautiful, Charleston is a beautifully growing, while there's some gentrification issues, they don't feel shame with their history. Savannah feels shame. Savannah wants to maintain, you know, that subjugated black class. So it's on purpose. It's on purpose, it's, you know, it, it's deliberate. You look at St. Augustine, their main trolley tours in St. Augustine have a black history tour. They celebrate all of that. They're not ashamed of it. Listen, this is what these antebellum families need to understand. Nobody black alive today blames anybody white alive today for slavery. We get it, we got it. We're not over it, but we got it. We're not gonna be mad, you know, if you give some weight to it, like New Orleans. New Orleans celebrates its jazz, celebrates its African-American history. They tell you about, okay, yeah, this was this bad thing, but we honor that. We honor all of our history. And I don't know why Savannah can't do that in a classy, gracious, and reverent way. Well, well, well said. It, it basically, to paraphrase what you're saying, is the, the antebellum historic charm that makes us uh, so attractive to visitors and people that want to want to live here is the very reason that the structural DNA of our fairness and esprit de l'on here is it is all wacky and sideways. It there has to be a way out of this, and we're, we hope that we're playing a small role in that. We we know that Julius. And ATR it, are, are, are knocking their socks off, uh, trying to educate uh, people and, and tell the real narrative. So, you know, I guess we're doing what we can do, but it is a problem. Jo yeah, it is a problem. I think until Savannah reconciles herself with her history. There you go. And embraces it, you know, trying to tell some of the, this old money that, Investment in African Americans and the African and the black side of town does not mean extraction from the rest of town. You see, when you make sure that black people have equity, because listen, we are five generations removed from economic, you know, intergenerational wealth transfer. But when you make sure that the black side of town eats, everybody eats. Every yeah. look at Atlanta. Yeah. Nobody's not there, you know, nobody's not making money on both sides of town. Black people are, 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 are thriving. There's still a huge wealth gap because the most wealthy black family in Atlanta is worth about $1 billion, while the most wealthy um, white family is worth, you know, $40 billion. That's a huge wealth gap, but there's upward mobility. The black side of town eats, the white side of town eats because unfortunately it's still very segregated even in Atlanta. You know, the, the farther north you go, it's whiter. The farther south you go, it's blacker. But the economic development, you know, they're working on equity and, and, and spreading it out greater here. You know, everyone knows that this is a great place for African-Americans to come for great opportunity, great jobs but nobody's suffering. You know, Arthur Blank is still a billionaire. You know, <laughs> Dan Cathy, who's the CEO of Chick-fil-A, still a billionaire. He does tons of business with the Russell family who are the black people. You know, that everyone gets along yeah. here. Nobody's losing any money and it's, and it's embraced and celebrated. And whatever the fear is in Savannah with these old antebellum mindsets, you know, it's only holding them back and what we know about inequitable policies is that, you know, the people who enact these inequitable policies, we consider them the predator. And the predator will eventually overhunt and consume themselves. And, you know, that's coming. Yep. And it's and well, it's, Alicia, and Alicia, since since 2015, you've been kind of behind the scenes at the forefront of a lot of policy in Savannah working with elected officials. And 
you know, it seems like many of the city staff, the upper echelon of the city staff, right? Department heads and above. They seem to be like this equivalent of the deep state, right? Mm -hmm. And like anyone that resists change, they're there to step inside. Like we've cycled two different councils out in 10 years, you said. And yet most of the people at the top are the same faces. What are your, what are your thoughts about that? Well, I will say this, Rob Hernandez was very good at restructuring the city. You know, he did away with the bureau chiefs. He promoted some really awesome talent within the city. Um, you know, I, a lot of these people are, are, so here's what I've learned about Savannah and Chatham County as a whole. A lot of these people have jobs because some, you know, some, there's somebody's kid, there's somebody's spouse, there's somebody's relative. It's a very uh, cronyistic and nepotistic uh, city staff in, in Savannah. Um, these people are, are left in place so that they can make sure that, the, you know, the, the, the money going out the back door to, to all the little shadow auxiliary units within the city continues to go out the back door. Um, this Sharehouse uh, was over, I think, the Parks and Recreation Department. Um, I actually interviewed, I you know, a because remember I used to write for the Savannah Herald. I actually interviewed with a federal investigator on on claims made by two sets of books for the Parks and Recreation Bureau back then. And, you know, maybe about six months after that interview, you know, he was resigning. He was out of there. He was going because they were, you know, Parks and Rec was running like a mafia, you know, greasing down. I can't remember the gentleman's name, greasing down this guy's palm to reserve certain parks. I mean, it was, it was terrible. The revenue department, we know that, that, that Hernandez dismantled that. Um, because they they were the culprits for the water bill fiasco because somebody's you know had an inside job on this new billing system um when you look at corruption think of corruption especially at the city level like a body it has an entire exoskeletal system a nervous system a cardiovascular system it is ingrained and in every little piece somebody's niece cousin, uncle, mm. grandchild, child has a job and it's woven in so intricately, it's really hard to get all that upper city staff out of there. I will say this, Marty Johnston was gone, you know, last term and, you know, Van brought her back. Miranda Lotson over at the Entrepreneur Center, for, I've heard that she's back, she was gone. And she's got a, you know, there was a huge scandal with her years ago, yet she persists. These people are the gatekeepers to the plantation is what I call them. Um, and the only reason these, 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 oh, these, someone said resurrecting these dead folks. The only reason they keep res resurrecting these people is by design. They've got to get the, the people in place who are going to do what these antebellum families who actually pull all the strings behind the scenes want them to do. These people are playing 3D chess. And, you know, a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of the people elected to council are, are either not even participating in the game at all or they're playing checkers. Well, they're, they're following uh, the deep state and uh, the, the oligarchical, uh, uh, desires for either the suppression of policy or the maintenance of policy, uh, whichever benefits them the most. Um, Alicia, the, the uh, Burnett's district, um, the first, and Estella's district, really seems, you know, in, in, in the 20 or 30 years I've been here, it seems like we've, we've pushed a lot of people in poverty uh, out in that direction, or maybe they've just never improved the situation in those districts while everything else around them has benefited. I, I, I'm seeing this concentration of, uh, of, of need out, out of West Savannah more than I've ever seen it before. I mean, 
Dietrich's and Linda's district are all gentrified. So, uh, you know, the, the nexus here for uh, poverty and, 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 and problems really is from a lack of attention while we were, you know, keeping everyone else uh, with, you know, projects and new drainage for Ardsley Park and, uh, you know, the Waters Corridor plan that never went anywhere. Um, uh, they didn't, they weren't even getting lip service. Now, now poor Brunetta got the arena dumped on her. And I understand she had to go along with it. But I, I think we can all agree that the arena was about about the worst way you could spend $170 million. Yeah, so those are the, those are the historically um, old original, you know, African-American sides of town. And, you know, the way gentrification goes and the way the, you know, these people in the South do business is they push the black folks to all the undesirable areas. Then once the black people start thriving, they pull out, economic investment in the infrastructure. But then the black people still manage to, you know, thrive. All of a sudden, something innovative comes down there because let's let's face it, it's hip to be on the black side of town sometimes. People love that sort of urban hip landscape. So then an art studio opens, a few artists and restaurants. People want to be on the black side of town where the black people are doing fun black stuff. Then all of a sudden they want it back. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, Black folks start sending their kids to college, so they all move out to Pooler. So now they want the Black side of town again. Then they're going to run that in the ground, you know, diminish all of the natural resources, kill the local environment. Then they're going to run back to the, to the, to the suburbs, and they're going to kick Black folks out the suburbs and put them back, you know, after they use up that. This is a cycle. This is what gentrification looks like. Hey, um, yeah, the... Uh... The Salvation Army special use permit deal uh, was the subject of our uh, Thursday night discussions a couple uh, episodes back. Um, what, why does it have to go there? I understand the need and the need is good. The need is worthy, but there are other locations that they could very easily apply for a special permit to go vertical on their existing property at Montgomery and Victory. But for some reason, th there's this uh, uh, high-speed express to put it on Augusta Avenue uh, in Burnett's district. Uh, you got any insight for us on that? They want to drive down the properties on that side of the town because they will drop dead before they give all those Negroes fair market value for their properties. They're coming for that side of town. They're going to probably ish, uh, use eminent domain to come for that for that side of town. What better way than to put, you know, a homeless shelter to drive down real estate values? Mm. You got to remember real what they here's what they want to do. They want to put a new set of projects, low income housing on the fairgrounds, which is toxic land. But they want to take all those people's property in West Savannah. They got to put them somewhere. They're going to move them all to the fairgrounds. That This is their hotel and hospitality workforce that they can pay peanuts. This is a plantation management program. The only reason you want to put a shelter on that side of town is to drive down property values. They want to destroy the African-American real estate wealth on that side of town. Yes, it could go a myriad of places. It should go in a very nice building away from all residential areas. Let me give you an example. The Salvation Army uh, uh, equivalent shelter in metropolitan Atlanta is literally smack dab downtown. It's a beautiful building. You don't mm. even know that that's what it is until you walk by. Mm. It's across the street from, across the, street yeah. from the aquarium in the Westin. Well, there, there, there's... Uh... There's been uh, pointed out numerous times that the Augusta Avenue location uh, doubles or triples the distance for uh, their clients, uh, 
homeless and 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 how yeah, they're, they're tar their target population yeah yeah uh it's further from all the social service connectors so i'm that's it's not poor planning it's poor planning it's poor planning it's 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 deliberate poor planning because yes. they always on the black side of town they always dump listen look at west savannah and and um Yamacraw Village over there. They leveled the row houses back in the 50s, the grocery store and all of that to build a post office and a housing project. And then they modeled the housing project after they modeled uh, Yamacraw Village after the Hermitage Plantation. It is literally a replica of the Hermitage Plantation. That's right. This is by design and if anyone thinks that it's just a bunch of people bumping around do, you know not knowing what they're doing you know they're clueless they wanted to put that same they wanted to put a homeless shelter where um on skidaway where um cohen's retreat was and that 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 side of town came out and said no way so now the that. black do you remember when they yeah. put what was that club what was the club that they wanted to put in with the thousand seat venue that lasted less than a year and now it's gone. Uh, um, yeah. And West on Savannah Bay Street, Leaders on Bay Street, on Bay Street. Yeah, yeah, on Bay Street. Stage on Bay, stage on Bay is what it was. Stage called. on Bay. What a what a resounding failure! Those people came there, said they didn't want it, said we don't want any more liquor. We trying to dry out the community, and 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 they listened to them. They continued it. That guy went and 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 hired. You know, some lawyers and lobbyists greased the right palms. They opened it. You know, what a waste. What a slap in the face to that community. They have been cannibalizing West Savannah for decades, you know. Um, and, and I just think that it's, it's, it's by design. None of this is on accident. And this isn't poor planning. This is deliberate planning. They're going to have to eminent domain a bunch of those houses in West Savannah. And the best way to come out as cheap as possible is to put an economic depressive entity over there. There is no reason to have, isn't that within certain amount of blocks of that school? Isn't that near Brock Elementary? Yes, yes. <clears throat> Why would they put people who could be known sex offenders and drug addicts and mentally impaired individuals that close to an elementary school that's pretty much primarily African American. It's across the street. It's a they do not care about black children. They don't. And well, we have not to interrupt you, but um uh we we, we floated the idea or the theory that maybe just maybe um, the reason this is so imperative that it leave its current location was because of the, you know, 30, 40, 50 million dollar investment that SCAD has made uh, on Montgomery and Crossroads in that corridor with uh, the acquisition <clears throat> of key properties and the construction of uh, uh, major dormitories, um, uh, you know, it, it just seems possible that, uh, you know, to, to take this uh, less than desirable uh, operation and move it as far away as possible from your uh, investment corridor kind of makes sense. But uh, uh, I, I don't know the answers. Uh, I guess if, if we see in the next, if, if, if they move out to Augusta Avenue and in the next two to five years, we see SCAD acquiring either directly or through a real estate uh, third party, the thing, I, you know, I guess we'll have the satisfaction of saying we were right, but that's little satisfaction or solace given that it's just was another example of business as usual, which is the title of the show. So. Yeah, you know, I think it can be off President Street. It really needs to be closer to J.C. Lewis Healthcare Center. 
you know, we're, we're in and, medical care. And defects and- And yeah. defects, yeah. It can be out, out off of there. You know, it, 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 that, that's <laughs> where it needs to be. Yeah, but and, Santa um, River Landing is too big, or what's it called now? Eastern Wharf is too upscale and uh, too powerful to- Because the houses are 600,000 there. Yeah, it, you know, the, the- But to be honest, that's where it's supposed to go. Oh, because listen. those are, those are, those, the, because that won't damage the property values in that area, they can withstand that. But in an already um, um, depressed neighborhood, it just damages it. it. Listen, these people know this. They know this. That's why we know it's deliberate. They're not fooling anybody. Listen, and I just want to make a point here. It, this is not us calling West Savannah a disadvantaged neighborhood. The U.S. Census says it is as a fact. Yeah. Okay. It's just, uh, you know, I've noticed the mayor, Van Johnson, you know, he plays up like it's a it's offensive to call a spade a spade. The problem is the problem. Call it the problem. Yeah, you got to be careful for people. He, he, he does a lot of virtue signaling. He does a lot of virtue signaling. He's become the virtue signaler of the year. Um, and he tries to guilt people, white people. He tries to guilt white people with these false narratives and these illogical fallacies on, you know, guess what? It's okay to call African-Americans black people. Nobody's offended. It's a generalization for people, you know, people of the African-American diaspora, you know, pe Africa, you know, calls them. So it's, it's okay to call the depressed or disadvantaged side of town um, exactly what it is. We know it's in a, it's in a, it's in a, a HUD census tract. <laughs> of poverty we know it's in a, in a in a red zone um yeah there's nothing wrong with calling it that they have not gotten the same infrastructure investment that the rest of the city has gotten therefore it is disadvantaged they have you know they won't let sylvester Formy build a grocery store over there they, you know, he's, he's got these wonderful plans to really develop that side of town. He cares about the environment. He built sustainable Fellwood, caring for the most vulnerable people in our community, which is our seniors. Um, it's beautiful. You got a black man. You know, they always say, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. There's a black man who's trying to, to, to invest, you know, and he just wants the same help that Kessler gets. Right. But he can't, he can't get anywhere. You know, so, you know, and he's got just as much money, but they won't let this man, you know, do for the side of town that he cares for. It, it, it's, it's ridiculous. Alicia, let, they, let, let me ask you on, on, on the arena and West, all, all the investment between the canal district and the arena, that's uh, uh, West Savannah. Does it, would it not make sense for the delegation to somehow, some way, get some legislation through that would uh, cap the property taxes uh, for the next uh, five or 10 years for everyone, not just the Stevens Day owner occupied, but the businesses and uh, vacant lots and all, all property that's gonna get the whammy ultimately from you know, 300, $400 million worth of investment in their community. Isn't that the... Uh, uh, unintended consequences, and shouldn't we do something uh, to mitigate that? Um, I would love to to say that that is the panacea for this problem, but Savannah has a corporate welfare problem. We would what 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 was the last number? There are eighteen thousand properties there that are tax exempt. We're, we're, we're hemorrhaging, how much was it we're hemorrhaging in what would be real estate taxes? Well, uh, 600 million, 600 million, but that, that includes government and military. And uh, yeah, I mean, there's, I mean, you know, the, the single largest parcel in Chatham County is Hunter Army Airfield. You know, it's not even close either, you know? So it's not just SCAD, it's the churches, it's the government and intelligence apparatus that are located here. Yeah, you know, there's but, a lot know, of different institutions. Well, so 
with with Hunter Army Airfield, Hunter Army Airfield supplies, you know, 50,000 military personnel and 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 well-paying jobs, you know. If it weren't for the military and all their VA loans, the real estate market wouldn't be as thriving as it is there, you know. So Hunter Army Airfield is an economic engine for Savannah because if you're not in the military, you you probably have a craptacular job. You either got to be in the military, work for Gulfstream, and then there's a tiny amount of good jobs at the city and at, at CETA that go to all the, you know, everybody's kids. Nobody can get in at any of those places. Um, someone told me something really interesting. Savannah's a one job town. If you come to Savannah for a good job, you got to keep that same job forever because there's nowhere to go. The same, you know, 50 people get all the good jobs. Look at, look at, Coco Pappy, she can bounce wherever she wants to go. She gets the same good job. You know, she goes from Savannah Country Day to the Creative Coast. Now she's in deep, you know, she it's like, there's like 10 people who've had multiple good jobs in Savannah. So um, as far as, you know, capping the, um, the property tax, I, I don't, I don't know without looking at everything if that is the solution. Um, we have Stevens Day. I, to be honest, I think that you know a part of the hotel motel tax could solve some of the problems, but it, it can't just all go to the Chamber of Commerce. You know, it can't all just go to visit Savannah. There are revenues coming in via you know regressive tax like like SPLOS, but how we're using this um how how they use this money um to drive economic growth is is the problem well if you look at the project list in, in the in the most recent uh agreement that failed um the lion's share of it setting aside 20 million dollars for river street which is just absurd but the rest of it basically is a left-handed funding source for the canal district because nobody voted on a canal district. Uh, you know, citizens didn't vote on it. It wasn't in a SPLOST. Um, so we, we are peeling off uh, big stacks of cash wherever we can to fund something that we didn't anticipate or did not want to share with the public about the uh, project, so. Yeah, this this is, you know, sadly, this is one of those things where, you know, perhaps Savannah should lose her ability to 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 use loss. Um, you know, we, we know that in in the previous administration, Stephanie Cutter passed out SPLOS money willy nilly to every district and no one ever voted on that. So, yeah. you know. Yeah. So we, Savannah's been abusing SPLOS for a long time. And SPLOS is also, you know, it's a regressive tax because it drives up the cost of, you know, all your goods. Yep. Um, and no matter how much money you make, you know, you're going to pay more for your loaf of bread. And when you go to the store than you normally would if all that SPLOS and East SPLOS wasn't tacked on. Um, and then it goes to the same, you know, few companies get awarded the contract. So it only benefits a small section of Savannah. I don't know. And I think Savannah has been, um, again, Savannah is the smorgasbord of, of corporate welfare. Um, capping the property tax, I think that we probably have a good deal of exemptions. I don't know if that's the answer because right now we know for a fact that the reason why we're in this predicament is because, you know, residential property taxes can't fully sustain the upkeep of a city's infrastructure. Well, we are not true, true, true. <clears throat> and, and I'm not suggesting that this is a uh, end all uh, global solution, but um, I, I, I can't help but logically believe that the property values, including Chatham Steel, by the way, it, are, are going to go through the roof once you make a half a billion dollar investment within a square mile radius okay uh -huh. so uh a, a, as much as so many citizens say we we got to have the arena 
uh, we, you promised it to us, we have to have it. It, it may wind up, I don't want it to wind up being uh, careful what you ask for. Uh, it, it's happening, there's no stopping it. So what, what are the consequences of it once it's finished and working? And that's what we should be thinking about right now. Not once these people property taxes uh, yeah. double. Okay, and if, if there's a legislative solution for for a uh, you know we do tag oh, yeah. tax allocation district business improvement zones enterprise zones there must be some uh, legislative uh, like a Prop 13. You're look you're, you're talking about like we what we have in California is called Prop Prop 13. Jarvis you Jarvis can. I, I'm saying, but in a defined geographic area, much like a, a enterprise zone to uh, give a buffer to the multi-generational families whose yeah. values are gonna skyrocket and good for them for, for wealth building, but they gotta be able to hold on to it and not lose it. And uh, mitigating that property tax, I think would be a, a worthy uh, effort or, or request to the delegation. Start working I, on it now. Start work, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, and now that I think about it more, yeah, I think that 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 is something that should that should come into play. Yes. Yeah, um, I don't know why I don't know why Brunetta had such a, a a a damn hard time trying to get community benefits agreements attached to the arena spending. Um, it, it she got slow rolled and and uh, poo pooed and uh, you know delayed. Uh, I. I I don't even know if they're in place now. Are they? Uh, no. You, you, you. Let's let's go back. Okay. Let's backtrack on how the arena came about. They said they wanted a sports complex, and then they got a sports development company to do the study. Oh boy. Well. So they never got a they never got a just an independent feasibility study. You know, they got they got Barrett Sports Complex to do the study. And all that means is when you when you call a, a you know a sports yeah. arena development firm, gonna they're get a going to tell you project. how. Sure. Yeah. yeah. They're going to say yeah. They're going to give you so it's a fake it's a fake study, um, and I don't think the public understood that at the time. Instead of it being an independent feasibility study, you got the sports developer to tell you yeah I could build you a sports arena. So they they shove that down the throats of the community. Um, nothing about this was 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 planned properly. It you know where this you know where the arena should be. The right. arena should be down off of two hundred four, closer to the ninety five, to a to a to a much larger thoroughfare. It should be right there in that pocket between ninety five and sixteen, where all that barren empty land is. Yeah. It can be right there. You will you will displace very few people um and you will have two major through fairs to access it and it would revitalize that side of town um and you probably could have gotten a private company to pitch in you know a hundred million dollars to put their name on it <laughs> you know yeah. so it, it it i don't think it's just me but thinking back over uh you know the last 15 years of two elections on SPLOS to fund this arena thing. Um, it was packaged and, and pushed out and presented by city staff as an alternative to the uh, Civic Center, okay? And they, they emphasized the important value of it to the citizens. Uh, the, the, occasional gun show or concert was secondary. And, and this was your new arena. This is your new civic center. And now, pretty clear to me, this was a chamber of commerce project uh, dressed up as some sort of uh, community center. So, uh, you know, the, the emperor has no clothes now, but it took us a while to figure it out. Yeah, it, you know, what's scary is we don't know what the, the, the local environmental and infrastructure impacts are going to be to that side of town. 
Um, I remember reading, you know, uh, talking with someone who was at the MPC. They're saying, we don't even know what's under the ground over there. We don't even know if that area can hold a structure, you know, that large. Like it's, 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 this is going to be interesting. It's going to be very much like that Plant River Hotel, which was very much behind schedule for trying to shore up the river. Yeah. Um, you know, and they're going to have to displace at least a square mile around it. I have no idea how they're going to get traffic to this, you know, yeah. from as far away from 16. I mean, they're going to, they're going to decimate, you know, downtown Savannah. Well, you, really, you really think that it's going to be flooded with people? <laughs> Nobody is coming to Savannah. I don't think so. I think it's going to be a white elephant. I, I hope I'm wrong because of the size of the investment and all the blood, sweat, and tears and pain that we went through over this dumb project. I mean, well. Uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to end up somewhere like the, uh, which finally is done. It, it possibly will be um, a huge white element like Boston's big it, dig. It's our, you know, make it close to home. It's our spruce goose. Right? It's our spruce goose, yeah. yeah. It's our heaven's gate, to use a, a film metaphor, you know? Um, yeah. So anyway, time will tell. Well, listen, you've been so kind. Chuck, do you have any... Uh, uh, I, have a, I have a question. Yeah. So uh, after we did the presentation in Atlanta, one of... Uh, I got in a really great conversation with um, the CEO of... Um, a visit Savannah and he didn't seem to understand the issue with the hotel motel tax creating this diversity equity inclusion plan and only creating one position for someone who's black brown um, or indigenous it, it creates one position for a person of color which would be housed under a majority uh, board which is dominated by uh, Caucasians. And this revenue stream only created a certain amount of money for a new museum and it created nothing for existing locations. What are your thoughts on the aspect of that and how the four women on council have been treated in the news and the media of uh, following their dissension um, and voicing their wants and needs uh, to counteract what was requested and explained in to council with the uh, diversity equity inclusion plan. So this is a this is a this is a great textbook example of of structural racism, um, and it's part of the reason why we don't like inclusion anymore. See, inclusion implies that someone else owns those spaces and they're including you in a yeah. tokenized way into right. these spaces that they own. The new movement is a movement towards equity. Um, there's nothing equitable about that plan. The, the women on council are experiencing, you know, they're, they're coming up against structural racism. Um, and, and that's just the bottom line, you know, just like women who come up against, you know, gender bias. If a woman is outspoken and she's, you know, she's a, she, I don't know if I can cuss, but she's a, you know, yeah. a B. Yeah. A woman, you know, a woman who's outspoken and driven is a bitch, but the man is a real go-getter. Yeah. Black people who are articulate and educated, you know, are up it. you know, we're not supposed to be you know, we're not supposed to have innovative thinking backed by, you know, formal education. These women are coming up against what's called structural racism. They are, sadly, they're, they're, putting, a, they're putting a crack in that glass ceiling. Um, creating one position um, and then suggesting that it be a slavery museum um, is tone deaf, is racially tone deaf for one implying that black people want to actually go to a museum called slavery museum because what we're what the majority of, of these people doing this stuff in council 
don't realize is, you know, we black people aren't the descendants of slaves. We're not. We are the descendants of African people who were enslaved. Um, to call black people descendants of slaves goes to the old definition of what a slave is, three fifths of a human. We know that that's not true. In fact, science has told us that dark skinned African American people are the only true 100% homo sapiens. The rest of us, is, even me, we're hybrids. That's a whole other conversation. So we gotta, we, there's a whole mindset shift that must occur. And the tone deafness of the slavery museum, the one little penny ante um, um, position, the Beach Institute yeah. and the King Tisdale Foundation, Cottage Foundation exists. There's a whole other entity that they could have funneled money to to, 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 to give equity to African-American culture and African-Americans in Savannah. There's, you know, the, um, what's the other place? The Kaya House. The Kaya House is over there. That needs a revenue stream. The Ralph Mark Gilbert needs a revenue stream. There are three existing museums over there who desperately need a solid revenue stream so that they can hire real staff and be run, you know, efficiently and successfully. They could have started there, but did they start? No, they want to erect the slavery museum to, to basically do another hermitage plantation replica move. This is what we call structural racism. I even think of maybe Bonaventure South, you know, um, putting some- Oh, you some, mean, um, not Bonaventure South, you're talking about, Laura, uh, is it Laurel, uh, Laurel Grove? Grove? Yes, sorry, uh, Laurel Grove South, putting something in there uh, or going to the Pinpoint Museum and putting some money in. I, I keep thinking in my head, the Gullah Geechee Village outside of Buford that gets funding from federal, a national, all kinds of, and it's cultivated. It, all these things could be cultivated even through Savannah State or a local university to help run it and then put some education into it. Um, and, I, and I heard word that the person that was going into that position didn't even have a background in um, you know, minority tourism. And I'm gonna tell you, owning a business it's a total different animal dealing with history and dealing with tourism. Like it's, it's some, it's, it's different. Well, isn't that the calling part of Savannah is to install someone who has no competency to run these things. So business, then they can say. Business as usual. Business as usual. Yeah. They, they install the most ill qualified person. So then they can say, we gave you black folks this money and you mismanaged it. Yep. And that and that and that is what they're going to do. That person won't care. They'll go over there. They'll pay themselves a big fat salary. Screw it all up. Depress it. You know. And again, that person who they tapped for that job likely um, is part of that system. You know that whole yep. that whole huge system of corruption. You know the exoskeleton, the nervous yep. system, the cart. They are a part of that, and they're willing to do it. Listen, I told black some black elected officials years ago. I said, let me tell you something. If someone comes to you for a payoff, if it's not ten million dollars, <laughs> say no. Yeah. Up your game. Because, yeah. Because, go big or go home. Yeah. That's right. Because studies have shown you need ten million dollars for your life to truly change. Your life is not changing on 50,000, on 40,000, on just getting a job. Your life is not changing on 100,000. Or, or private yeah. jet ride. Yeah, I'm sorry. There you, listen. But you know private whose life is changing? You know whose life is changing? When somebody goes from making 750 an hour to, to 1250, you know, that's life changing. You know, I, I, I mean, I, I am just tired of sacrificing progress for the many for the status quo business as usual of the few thank you and you know what's so sad about this whole thing what's that, that? little 12 15 hour these 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 multi-millionaire hoteliers aren't gonna feel that but you know what will happen 
they'll actually start making exponentially a whole lot more money because now these people will have more discretionary income to go and stay at some of the properties to buy small developers will make more money because you'll have more money. It, 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 what's sad about it is they don't see that. And that is what structural, that is what racism does to the harbinger of the disease of racism. They're so blinded by their racism that they don't even realize that, wait a minute, if I stop this and pay them more, it's going to be recycled right back to me. We're going to, more businesses are going to open. More tourists are going to come in. Everybody will win and they will get richer, but they can't even see it. It's the reason the Confederacy fell in the first place. And this medieval fiefdom in Savannah will eventually consume itself. You know, their, their grandkids are, are, will be run out of town. They're going to run out of money. The coffers are going to dry up one day um, and it's going to be a disaster. And it's, and it's really sad. Hey, yeah, I think a good example of what you're talking about is the portion of the uh, DeSoto that has been, you know, sectioned off to private housing. You know, there's there's no reason that parts of these hotels may not become like full time residences uh, for people that have money. Yeah, yeah, they it it, it it's they don't they don't realize it. Um, they yeah, like you said, five dollars more an hour will change the lives, but it'll also flood the community with more money. Then you're going to have a higher quality employee, which is going to improve, you know, your customer base, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Everyone in the city will thrive, including everyone at the very top. They'll well, even have a benefit from writing off more in taxes on payroll. So they're going to keep more money in their pocket but they don't care. This is what the disease of racism does. And this is what structural <clears throat> racism looks like. Well, uh, it, I, I want to switch over from philosophy uh, to reality uh, and then back. And, and my, my point, uh, Alicia, is we know because the tourism industry brags about it, that they have roughly 30,000 employees. We know from Georgia Department of Labor reports that half of those people are making less than $10 an hour. We know that 28% of the population of the city of Savannah lives in poverty. We know that another 20% is one or two paychecks away from joining the 28%. It's that fragile, okay? Given that we know where the source of our poverty wages exist. Why do we keep funding and investing and giving the keys to the city to an industry that really doesn't help us get out of this hole? I, I mean, it's just crazy. I think it boils down to, again, those antebellum families. You know, we, we can't expect Savannah to just change her ways. Well, you don't just like because, you don't like them blaming the schools because that's the classic. Oh well, you know, if, if we had higher trained people, we could pay them more. Oh well, listen, the school board is a, the the rabble had a a show a couple of weeks ago. The school board is everybody hates the school board administration. They what is it one two three Bull Street or three o three o one Bull Street two o eight two o eight yeah. Everybody hates 208 Bull Street. It's all connected. The school board is grossly mismanaged. The transportation is, is a resounding, towering, inflamed failure. Um, the teachers are mistreated. You know, we, we, we hemorrhage good teachers. Um, but that comes down to the state. When they, when they, when they uh, funded, what was it, QBI? Um, in the previous QBE. cycle, his deal was on his way out back to like 1984 levels. Listen, it, 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 this thing goes deep. It goes all the way back to Atlanta um, as well to that golden dome in Atlanta. Um, yeah. It's just what people don't realize is Georgia was, was the cradle of the Confederacy. 
we're asking this state to change her stripes, literally her her, her bars and stripes, you know, her stars and yeah. stars and bars. We're asking this state. I mean, let me tell you a little story about how I know that it's there's something grossly wrong with Georgia as a whole. Alexander Stevens was the vice president of the Confederacy, and he gave the cornerstone speech at the Anethium Theater, which kicked off the Civil War. Uh, the 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 Anathem is where the Savannah Theater is now. Um, people don't realize that was where the Confederate Convention was. His home and his estate is almost perfectly preserved <laughs> in Waynesboro, Georgia. Perfectly preserved and funded by the Alexander Stevens, you know, trust. This man's legacy is still alive. Yeah. Celebrate the tax celebrated, of, celebrated, celebrated. Yeah, his house. They have the audacity. So he's buried there in front of his house. His family graveyard is there. Now listen to this. You ready for this? The family graveyard and the old church that's there is still there. There are headstones from the 1700s, from the 1800s, and are you ready for this? Yep. From 2012, 2019. Those families know who they are, they're still alive, they're still enjoying the fruits of all of that. That's old slave Confederate money alive well today. Great, great granddaddy Alexander Stevens house, they can go visit it. They even have the audacity to have the slaves that he owned on the marquee explaining this document. And the slave quarters are still preserved. Herman Talmadge Bridge. In, in a in, in a black majority city that that suffers to this day from institutional racism and and exclusion. I mean, it's absolutely nutty. Well, listen. And yeah, uh, Eugene Talmadge, and and he did that on purpose. He named that bridge after himself because Savannah desegregated first. Savannah integrated first, and he did it as open rebuke. But have you heard this story? I'm going to tell you, I'm going to share this story real quick. Eugene Talmadge, you know, he was about to win a third term as governor. And remember, he sanctioned um, a lynching in Augusta uh, in his previous term. And he was coming back and going to win a third term. In social black, circle. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and a black elder in Savannah said his grandmother told him, that they just couldn't stand it because not only was he racist, he was a mean, nasty, overt racist. You know, he'd get on TV and use the N word willy nilly. He said a pamphlet circulated all across Georgia, all through Savannah, where they had a prayer visual. And the message that the black community used was, God, please deliver us from this man. They had a whole prayer visual that, you know, that man dropped dead a week later and never took office for his third term. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And I said, you know, and, and I and I've heard recently from someone else that the same thing happened with the previous Chatham County Sheriff before before <laughs> who was it? St. St. Lawrence. Saint Lawrence, yeah. The but prior to St. Lawrence, he didn't he, there was a sheriff in Savannah who said that's not going to be turned into MLK Jr. Boulevard over my dead body. They said the churches got together and prayed to deliver him from him, and he died. And they named it MLK Junior Boulevard. <laughs> let's finish. So, let's finish on this topic here because John, in in a conversation the other day, you know, we were we were talking, and and I said to you, you know, everybody acts like the business interests, the elite, like they aren't pressuring politicians to deliver their agenda. Oh, and and what we're doing here is changing the political calculation that if you go along with business as usual, we're going to call you out and we're going to continue to call you out. And, and we're just doing the same thing, you know, with less money and less power as those, the, the elites. So Alicia, why don't we end on you telling our audience a little bit more about what you are doing with ATR, all things relevant media. seems like these two organizations are the only ones kind of pushing a counter narrative to the local establishment media. Why don't you talk a little bit to us about that? So, yeah, so I'm, I'm one of the co-founders of ATR Media. 
Um, you know, I launched my show sometime uh, last summer, and then I got with Julius Hall on an on a business model to 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 bring more uh, creators uh, under a channel to give us some sort of local black political news, um, sort of like a BET or a TV one. Um, the goal of ATR Media is to get regular people in the community. Um, you know, you guys, have, you, John, you, you've been a guest on ATR. We want the people that actually care about Savannah to, to have a platform because Savannah Morning News is, is, is biased. You know, it, it's, it's they, they, that, uh, that the news company that bought them, they're capitalizing on the conservative and racial nature of, the, of, of what the Morris family had created which is another family living off corporate welfare. That's another story. Um, so ATR's goal is to, is to create a news channel uh, driven by African-Americans for African-Americans, uh, educating. Yet we gotta remember, I mean, we've, we've had these discussions, John, the African-American voting populace in Savannah rarely votes on policy. They vote on personality. We, they vote in, they vote in their pastors, social workers, and they coach. Football coaches. Um, and they don't understand that, you know, what qualifies you to actually be a good public servant and an elected leader is you need to have some competency on what it is a city needs to run and thrive. And you should have some vested interest in her most vulnerable population. It happens to be African-Americans. We know that if we can get economic development in the African-American demographic within Savannah, we're gonna alleviate crime. That benefits everybody. We're gonna, you know, <laughs> it benefits it. We're gonna, we're gonna provide you with more people who can pay the rent on your income properties. That benefits everybody. Um, you know, it, so we're trying to educate the black population of Savannah on hey, listen, just because they're Black, you don't have to give them your vote. You want to give the vote to the person who has the best interest of the city as a whole and who understands that, hey, there's this population. We need to do a little massaging on or we need to implement policies that are going to help that, that side of town thrive because when that side of town thrives, the other side of town thrives and everybody thrives. So that's what we're trying to do at ATR is to help educate um, and bring real news to, to one to all of Savannah, but we definitely needed a new media platform because we can't just go on the Savannah Morning News having the only political influence in town. We needed to disperse some of that power. Um, we, we, we all really need to boycott the Savannah Morning News. It's anti-Semitic, it's racist, it's anti-people. You know, they've endorsed Donald Trump, who was a misogynistic, anti-Semitic, racist, bigot, um, you know, sexual harasser. He was, you know, the, the clown in chief. Um, we really need to, 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 to cancel our subscriptions <laughs> and to not read it. And to quite frankly, we need to stop sharing it. Um, if you get it at your house, I'm not saying, you, you know, you do what you want to do. But, you know, they have an agenda and that agenda is business as usual. So um, ATR is, is, is a force that's trying to combat that. Um, we simulcast across a couple of, of programs. Um, we don't want to just be the harbinger of bad news, but we do seek to be a systems leader, which is, you know, if you look at the media, it's a system. And we're trying to catalyze systems change in the mainstream media in Savannah and Chatham County. Well, thanks for joining us. We appreciate you coming on to tell us all about that and uh, give us your perspective on some of the current events going on here in Savannah. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. I hope that I an answered all of your questions well. It, it was a, a pleasure having you and uh, Inglewood Forum, kudos to you for uh, 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 pushing back, uh, articulating and changing minds, um, we're with you on that. And we, uh, we, we all want a better Savannah. And I'm not being trite when I say that. Um, no, I know, yeah. Yeah. You, Chuck, you, you know where we, yeah. Uh, Chuck, why don't you 
tell our, our, our listeners how they can really help us because we need their help. Well, I'll just put it in there. Carrie, I, I yeah. asked if you could do it. Go ahead, Carrie. I got you. I just want to say, uh, I, I just want to do a plug. One of my favorite shows on ATR is the uh, the show where they show a path of people who, um, you know, had a had a felony and a pathway and they're sharing oh, their yeah. stories. I love that show. It is positive. Yeah. Incarceration um, to incorporation. That's it. I love it. That I, I try to tune in every week. I think it's courageous. And uh, I love hearing stories, positive stories, and love what Julius is doing to inspire. Um, yeah. There is life on the other side of that. So. Yeah. Yeah. The goal is to, the goal is to help um, Black people become more economic, more economically sound um, with knowledge and opportunity. So that is the goal. No, you know, listen, I, I hate to say this, but black people have never asked for government handouts. We've only ever asked to be left alone. <laughs> you know, we, we literally, when you look at the civil rights movement, it was like, will you just, please don't lynch us. Can we please go to college so yeah. we can pitch into this country? Um, and it just, it's just been this legacy of, of structural racism, systemic racism, and, and, and quite frankly, just harassment, you know, we move, you know, the, I think they're mostly, been, I, I, aren't they just looking for what Sherman promised them on the veranda of that house on Bull Street when he wrote, uh, special order number 17 or whatever, you know, uh, 40 field, acres, yeah, uh, field, field, yeah, field, field order, yeah. field order 15, 15. um, you know, to, to be honest, we, this new generation, now, now we're looking for equity. Um, and if you're going to give corporate handouts to all of them, then you give it to us. Quit telling us to stop looking for government for help. Because when you think about Gulfstream, owned by General Dynamics, they're one of the largest contractors to the federal government. They only exist because of public money. You know, if so let's let's stop pretending like government can't do anything for you right. that's an a lot you know they've convinced us to oh, stop looking. we're not looking for handouts the one we're just looking for equity we can figure it out you know remove the red tape remove the, the roadblocks and black people just want to contribute thrive coexist love on our community like any place else you know so well so. when you go down that rabbit hole of general dynamics sooner or later you end up in november 1963 in dallas fort worth texas so i don't really think uh we have enough time tonight no, uh, to go down that rabbit hole uh but i just want to remind everybody that if uh you can consider supporting us uh in this mission of what we're doing here at better savannah i pin the uh the the membership uh, link it's better savannah.org uh, slash donate dash membership uh, is the uh, website yep uh, so I pinned that tweet please consider uh, joining uh, we'll, we'll put you into our our, our members group and uh, you'll see a little bit more about the behind the scenes of what we're doing uh, and be able to join in with us so Carrie John any final thoughts or plugs before we end this week's episode no I just want to make sure uh, to mention that we have the uh, membership uh, subscribers that they can become a member and we're going to have member only content we're going to start that um and i'm re really excited because you we had one person sign up uh right and so you can you need to sign up it's a low fee and uh, it will provide you as we go through the next coming months some really educational opportunities um and so just just keep aware of that yeah, I, I want to say if, if a members only jacket isn't your style, five, 10, 15, or $20 uh, will, will go a long way to uh, help us uh, boost our message uh, out to everyone. Um, so it's just been a, a pleasure. And thank you, uh, Alicia, for taking your valuable time and joining us. I hope you come back sometime, would you? I would definitely come back some sometime. You know, John, you're one of my favorite people. So uh, yeah, of course, <laughs> anytime. You know, I don't want to get you in trouble. I know I'm joking, but you know, <laughs> no. but yes, yeah, absolutely. Heartfelt. Thank I see you. you cut your hair. Yeah, well, it was a COVID promise after I was double vaccinated, and it was literally a year and five days 
between my last haircut and uh, the current haircut, but thank you. And I, I just wanna thank uh, Carrie and Chuck and Will for making this happen. It's been a pleasure. Hopefully uh, we've, we've reached some people with a good message and we'll continue to do it. So until we thank meet again- Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you. And good night to all our viewers. Have a good night, everybody. Bye-bye.